All right, guys, we got Player's Corner, uh, episode five, I believe. It's been a while since we've done one of these, and I got Jeff Scott here. Uh, I've known Jeff for a long time. I, I coached him uh, with the Indiana Bulls, how long ago? About six years ago? Yeah, right now. No. Yeah, uh, and Jeff uh, Jeff was a, a big prospect coming out of high school, ended up going to Coastal Carolina, um, and then he'll tell you a little bit more about a story. He ended up at Bowling Green. Um, but essentially, we're going to let him talk and kind of tell you guys that are watching, some of the young athletes that are watching that need to know what college baseball is really like and you know what to look for and the type of uh, effort and attitude and, and hard work that this guy puts into everything that makes him a great ball player. So um, essentially, Jeff, kind of give them background on your story a little bit and exactly you know where you're from in high school-wise and what you're doing and where you, where you came from. Well, um, first thing is I'm from a small town, Clint County. Uh, Forest, Indiana. I mean, not very many people, about 300 people maybe in the town. Yeah. Uh, went to a high school, graduated with 84 kids in my senior class. Um, wasn't really looked at in high school, for like high school games at least. Uh, I mean, coming out to the middle of nowhere is probably not one of the best uh, recruiting um, tools, tools yeah, that to use to yeah. get to somebody. But uh, I ended up playing for the Bulls when I was 13. Um, and Obviously, being able to play with them from 13 to 18 was one of the things that kind of helped me. Um, being able to play at bigger schools uh, during the summer, kind of get that more of a um, more exposure. Yeah, more exposure. College playing, more, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, more expo exposure and uh, just being able to be seen, I guess. And uh, honestly, like I got seen in a position that I didn't even play in high school. Yeah. So that was one of the things that was kind of different because. Um, once the school started talking to you and stuff, you had to explain yourself uh, yep. that a high school team is different than what you're doing during the summer. and um, So that kind of was different for me, I guess, being a pitcher, shortstop, pitcher, infielder in high school. Yeah. But then um, all summer I'd catch, and that was all I'd do. So it was different for them to see me there and then not see me in high school. Yeah, so you're basically telling them how important it is to be fun, being a multi-purpose athlete, be able to play multiple positions. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that that – is what helped me, I think, was being able to understand all the positions on the field. I played a little high or a little outfield uh, at the beginning of the summer, like when we had kids that were still in the state tournament, whatnot. Um, but being able to understand all the positions uh, I ended up helping me more as a catcher yeah. than anything, just because I know what people need to do when balls hit to them, what where to send the ball when it's hit, Absolutely. And stuff like that. It helped, it helped. It helped me direct traffic yep. per se more as a catcher knowing the other positions and it ended up actually helping me out um, when I ended up at Bowling Green being able to play outfield when we had a ca solid catcher yep. but we didn't have any we didn't have any stability in the outfield. Yeah, needed more athleticism. We needed more athleticism and we needed a bat yep. so I took my skills to the outfield and played more outfield than I did catching. Yep. I mean, I'd still catch midweek or whatever, but being able to play multiple positions just shows that athleticism and more of a projectability type thing. Absolutely. Just to, yeah. to show you that you can do more than one thing. Yep. And to go back on that, in high school, I was a three-sport athlete. Mm -hmm. Didn't stop playing football until my senior year, but I wrestled, played football and baseball. And that was one of the things that, like, coaches – they love eat it. Up. Yeah, they, they love eat it. it. They eat it up. I mm -hmm. mean, just being able to be an athlete overall in different sports. Hundred percent. Yeah, and that's. I think people get caught up, especially baseball players, get caught up in thinking they they're one position. Yeah. They're a shortstop, yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. all yeah. they can play at, right? Yeah. And I remember I I played shortstop in high school and played third base and shortstop for the Bulls, mm -hmm. and I go to South Alabama and go play right field. That's yeah. the number I go in too. Yeah. So. I think people get caught up in that they don't understand like your your positions wherever your college coach has said it's going to be first yeah. of all, yeah. and but being athletic like him, multi sport athlete, um, went to state a couple times as a wrestler, yeah. um, so the athleticism that he has, he can pretty much go anywhere and play anywhere. So that's really really important right there. And so you kind of you got recruited mm -hmm. and you end up getting recruited and going to Coastal Carolina, correct? Yeah, uh, went to Coastal Carolina right out of high school. Um, went there. To for our fall of 2014, um, it was kind of a different experience for me, like I said, being from a small town, going down to Myrtle Beach, uh, a little bit bigger of a city. Mm -hmm. It's really small, honestly, one of the smaller schools, and that's kind of why I went there. Um, I didn't want, for me personally, I didn't want to go to that 
bigger school mm -hmm. that like a whole lot of students and you just be having to be now, yeah. having to walk 40 minutes to class like I know that some other campuses have and yeah. stuff like that like I wanted to be like right next to everything I wanted to be able to interact through the whole campus without having to really like trek and Absolutely. stuff like that so I mean that was one of the things that drew me there um, and obviously like warm weather all that good stuff uh, was one of the things and their success throughout the years as well mm -hmm. um, but going into it um, was kind of a an experience for me that was different just because of I knew what it took to work hard coming from the small town but getting there and actually getting into the whole um, experience of being in classes having lifts at 6 a.m. having practice from to, uh, like 2.30 to 5.30 with early hitting is an hour before practice. Essentially like four or five hours. And then, yeah, and then you're for like four nights a week is two hours worth of study study hall or study tables uh, so that you're making sure you're getting your stuff done, especially as a freshman. I mean, they'll, they'll mandata mandate that just so that you can keep ahead of your academics and stuff like that. But it was basically a full day job Absolutely. every day. And, I mean, it was a grind and um, it took me a while, I think, to actually discover how to um, like work through that day. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, you I was used, used to. to I was used to going to school seven hours a day in high school. Going to school seven hours a day, like an hour and a half practice, and then that was it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here it was, you get a class at eight a.m. after your five thirty or six a.m. lift. So you go to that class. You may have a little break, but you can't go home. Mm -hmm. Or you can't go back to your dorm, so you gotta go find food somewhere, which is usually one of the dining halls or something like that. Um, or if you're lucky enough that freshmen can have cars, you could drive over to a rep, like a subway or whatever, mm -hmm. get your food, come back, go to another class. Um, if you had time in between classes, you walk over to like we had a study tables room yep. that you can get extra hours in, yep. get your stuff done. Early hitting started an hour before practice, so you go out and hit, or we'd have early defense some days too, just so you can get some extra defensive work in, stretches, whatever. Yeah. Um, so, and then practice for three, three and a half hours. Yeah. And study hall after, so you're study hall after, so you gotta get food after practice, yeah. and head straight to study table so you can get those two hours in. Get home around 9, 30, 10 o'clock, hang out, maybe get another little snack, Talk with your roommates a little bit, hit the Do bed, it all over and again. wake up the next morning at 5.36 a.m. again. Yeah. So, I mean, that was one of the things that just, like, really opened my eyes to what the whole thing's about. Yep. And now that I'm going into my senior year, I think I've gotten a better handle on it just by having to go through it. You yeah. know what I mean? It's, it's easier for you to actually go through it than to have someone explain it to you because... If I had someone explain me their day, I'd be like, wow, like, I don't know. Like, I, like, how do you do this? But once you, like, the first, like, two weeks is just like, holy cow, like, this is terrible. Like, you're going to feel like it's not going to stop. But it starts rolling, and you start kind of getting used to it. And it's one of the things that, like, not, like me now, like, I enjoy waking up. Enjoy the And drive. working, yeah. And yeah. I, I've fully embraced it, and I enjoy it. And, I mean, that's one of the things that's going to have to happen is that you're going to have to get used to it and kind of just embrace it and yep. hope that you get through it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So what do you, I mean, he, he's essentially saying it's from 6 a.m. or 5.30 a.m. to about 9.30 p.m. You're busy and you're working and you're, you know, you're going to classes, you're going to practices, you're getting the extra work in, you're getting everything you're supposed to do in. That's why in college you'll see a lot of guys, and I would say the, the, the failure rate is probably 25, 30 percent of guys just disappear when they go and play college baseball. It was like that for me at South Alabama, and I'm sure he's, there's guys that show up and they can't get their classes in, they can't keep their grades up, they don't want to show up to classes, you know, and then, they, and then in, in, the, in the practices they kind of break them down, the coaches, you know, they break them down, they're not mentally tough enough. And, you know, with him, I know he's mentally tough, he's a very strong guy up here, so just, just as much as he is physically, but... When it comes to college baseball, and you've heard me talk about it before, but you know it's a perfect example right here. It's a grind, and you got to be tough mentally and physically to get through that grind. You got to be prepared, and nobody's technically "quote unquote" prepared for it. 
but it's something that you either adapt or die to, one of those two things. Um, so that's good stuff right there. Um, so you ended up going uh, from Coastal Carolina, and then you went the JUCO route, and then transferred to Bowling Green. Mm -hmm. um, you want to touch on that a little bit? Um, basically, I was at Coastal Carolina the whole uh, fall and spring of my freshman year. I ended up uh, getting redshirted at the end of the year in the spring. So I basically traveled with everybody, and my primary position was a catcher. So I was basically a bullpen catcher the whole spring of my freshman year. I traveled, went on all the road trips, uh, still did everything with the team, um, ended up getting redshirted, went and played summer ball, came back, um, and thought I had a pretty good spring, or pretty good fall, um, caught really well, hitting was a little hit and miss, but um, we had a couple other catchers that they brought in, uh, Juco kids, and they were probably going to eat up some, a lot of, a majority of the innings, and uh, basically told me that if I wanted to play, I'd probably have to go somewhere else. Uh, and they didn't want me I have to sit for two whole years. They didn't mm -hmm. want me waiting to play and stuff like that. So I ended up uh, um, for like around Thanksgiving break going around and kind of when I came home, going on visits and stuff like that, kind of starting the recruiting process all over again, yep, yep. which was different. Um, it's a little different when you're coming out of school, from one school to another, um, just in the fact that it's more of the schools really that's a neat necessity yeah what they what they need for you to come in and stuff like that so I ended up uh, finding a little school down in Robinson Illinois called uh, Lincoln Trail and uh, they made me feel like family from the first day that I visited there yeah. uh, gave me the opportunity to come in I mean I think I started about 95% of the games and behind the plate so it gave me the opportunity to get that full first spring of college experience in um, without having to really take any uh, um, repercussions of transferring yep. whatnot, sitting yep. out a year. So that was the best option for me was to go the JUCO route. And I'll, and I'll interrupt him real quick, but a lot of people up north especially, and down south JUCO is big time. A lot of, a lot of big time ball players go to JUCO, but up here up north people don't understand that that's a great route to take. And, Jeff's been a D1 ball player. He's been a D1 prospect in high school, and he's a legit D1 ball player now. And JUCO was a great route for him. I know a lot of guys that went JUCO because you know they may they might not have been necessarily recruited and out of high school, and they end up getting drafted sixth and seventh route. So it's college baseball is college baseball. You've got to be a dude to play college baseball in general. And that was an example of a route he went to Coastal Carolina, which now is considered a top ten program in the nation. Um, and then now he's, you know, going to JUCO. So that just shows you right there, you know, there's a lot of talented guys at that JUCO level as well. But sorry and to interrupt you. No, one of the things I want to add in on what you just said is that a lot of people think that the JUCO are just for kids that don't have grades. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I ended up going to my JUCO for one semester. Uh, it was the spring of 2016 and ended up getting my associate's degree in that semester. Nice. Because of my classes being able to transfer over from coastal and then classes I had to take there, but uh, a lot of people think that it's just for kids that don't have the grades. And honestly, it's one of the things that I took it as is that I feel like I'm a smart kid. I I got the grades when I was in school and I got the grades when I was in college as well. But the one thing that I needed it for was more of that, uh, um, I guess like a preparation. For yeah. going into college baseball, you know what I mean. Getting like people, rest. people don't understand that the JUCO route isn't terrible, and it's not. It shouldn't be looked down upon just because you're going into JUCO. Um, that was one of the things I kind of thought when I was going through the recruiting process. I was like, I don't know if I want to go to JUCO because I don't want to step down and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. There's just as good many good baseball players there in a JUCO that they're in D1. Um, there are really good JUCO programs. Around. It's more of it's more of the um, I guess preparation and um, just like what's the word I'm looking for? Um, getting you ready for that. Yeah, just get, yeah, that. just getting you ready yep. for it. Yeah, I'm getting and, ready for that grind. And then I. Like I said, I played about 95% of our innings there and ended up being able to go to Bowling Green, who I played a couple summers with a couple kids that went there, and that kind of helped me out. Mm -hmm. um, made me feel like home, I guess. Had a couple brothers I played with That's that awesome. were on summer ball teams through the summer and hung out with a lot during the summer. Um, that 
ultimately helped me get there. And I mean, they took me in just like my junior college did, took me in. Uh, and that was one of my goals was to get back to that Division One level yep. because I felt like that's where I needed to be. And yeah, I felt like I did need to take a step back and really focus on what I needed to do to get me there. And uh, that was one of the things that really helped me mentally. Um, just being able to work every day. Absolutely. Work every day, work to back to where I needed to be and like set more goals and stuff like that. Um, and I guess I've been there ever since and I've, I guess made it, I would say a major impact on uh, the team there. And yeah. I was elected a co-captain my first year there out of my junior, junior college. And last year I was basically one of the leaders as well. So hopefully this year is gonna be the same thing, yeah. help out. And, Played three three years of summer ball, and then you just kicked ass this summer, just working out and training, and getting that swing better, ready for your senior year. Too. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's good stuff. So you know the reason we do these player corners, the reason we do these interviews and questions, and 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 Jeff's coming from you know the perspective of getting recruited to a big D one, and then going transferring to JUCO, and then transferring to another D one program. You know this is this is what college baseball is like. This is one of the stories. You know. Um, I kind of get you an idea, and I'll, I'll break down things in the future, and we'll talk about more stuff in the future too. But um, you know, he's sharing the story for people that want to watch. You know, maybe you know parents that watch it don't understand how things are like. You know, and, and for the players that want to see what it's like and see the kind of development. You know, and he played for the best travel baseball program in the Midwest, in the Indiana Bulls, and you know he, he got that opportunity, and you know with his talent level um, to play there, and now he's he's moving up the ladder and, and ready to kick ass this next spring in 2019, and. Uh, essentially, I'm gonna wrap it up, Jeff, with a couple, of, just a couple of questions. And the first thing is, is you know, knowing what you've been through and knowing what's going on, and knowing all the players that you've seen in college, what is the number one weak point from, I would say, the majority of of high school baseball players that are going to college? What what is the number one thing that I, I would say they roughly all weak at? Um, honestly, with me being at Bowling Green the last uh, two years, it's the longest I've been at school, and be able to see more people come in, you know what I mean, like freshman wise and stuff like that. Um, I think that right now it's just a lot of mental toughness and wanting to do the work and wanting to fail. I mean, honestly, it's yeah. you have to fail to be able to get better and that's one of the things that these kids don't know is that failure is good and yeah. trust me, like I said, going from uh, Coastal, I was a bullpen catcher all through the spring, I could have sat my head. Uh, sunk your head. Yeah, right? sunk my head and just kind of let it eat at me. And then uh, I ended up talking with one of our our strength and conditioning guy at Coastal and was just talking about it. And just like it, he kind of seen that was kind of wearing me down. And it's just like you just need to take it as a positive uh, a positive uh, impact in your life and just get better from it. And he goes, there's nothing wrong with having to do this. Yeah. And I just think that kids coming in are afraid to fail and they're just not mentally tough enough. They haven't right been now, through that failure. They have, yeah, out. they haven't been through the failure, and they haven't been through the grind enough of mm -hmm. what they need to do. I agree. Yeah, they they get babied a lot, and, and instead of coaches telling them what they're doing wrong, you know, they're they're the superstar at their high school, yeah. and everything's yeah. okay. Instead of working through the adversities and and fixing things you're not good at. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, going like little or big fish in a little pond. Yeah. And that was me in high school, and I don't want to sound like that, but it was basically. I was one of the first Division One base, or probably our only Division One baseball player, come through my high school. So that was one of the things that was just like everyone's like ooh and ah, and then you yeah. get to the college and they're like, well, yep. tough luck. Guess everybody's what? Like everybody's that. that. Every everybody's that good. Yeah. Everybody. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you come from one of the biggest high schools in the nation. It doesn't matter if you come from one of the smallest. I mean, you all put this pants on the same way, and you all got to put strap on your shoes and get ready to go through shit to get. Yeah. to get better so absolutely yeah essentially you got to be humble and work like you're broke yeah i mean that's essentially what you need to do is essentially what he's saying so um what would be the number one advice um for those guys is say you know for anywhere between 13 to 17 years old that are that are wanting to go through this process wanting to play college baseball what's the number one piece of advice you give to them just work hard man that's i mean that's one of the things you got to be able to strap your boots on and go to work. That's mm -hmm. one of the things that you got to get extra swings in. You got to put work in the weight room, uh, staying healthy, eating right. I mean, it's it's not just baseball. It's, it's not, just a little part it's of not the just, It's not just for pitchers throwing. It's not just for hitters hitting or fielding ground balls. It's 
fielding another two or three buckets of ground balls. It's mm -hmm. stretching out a little bit more when your arm's sore or something like that for pitching. It's hitting another bucket or something off the tee when you're alone. Absolutely. When you're not, no one's looking. That's the one thing that I was brought up on is you're only the best is when no one's watching. Yep. So if you're not training enough or you're not training to want to be the best, then how are you going to be the best? Yeah, you can't be an elite hitter any two times a week. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can't, you can't be a dude in the weight room going through the motions. Right. Absolutely. That's yeah. good stuff right there. Um, it's 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 one thing, and, and I, I appreciate Jeff sharing his story in this aspect of things, and the guys watching, you guys should like the video and appreciate him sharing it as well. Um, I got nothing but pride and respect for him, you know, as, as a coach, um, you know, seeing his development, seeing what he is, you know, he's a strong young man. I look forward to seeing you kill it in the spring this year. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what I'm hoping. I mean, yep. put a lot of work in this summer for us. So. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, guys, so again, uh, like the video, subscribe. Uh, Jeff sharing that story for you guys, you know, you know, parents and athletes that are wanting to be at that next level, you know, this is kind of an idea of what it's like and kind of an idea of what you should be looking for and humble yourself, you know, work your ass off. That includes the weight room, on the field, in the cages when nobody's watching. That's what sets you apart from everybody else. That's what's going to get you guys to the next level. So Larry's training. We'll see you guys later. See you.